Games put us into the position of top-down power, where more authority and control always means more gameplay and function, and as such, cannot easily demonstrate bottom-up or grassroots movements and power. I've already defined social history in the main series video, but since we're going to be talking about it again, here's a brief definition, and then we'll move on to what this video is actually about. Social history is an academic lens for viewing history focused on the lived experiences of the people and their reactions and responses to events. The reason I keep calling this a bonus episode is that it doesn't directly explore a concept native to academia, but it does provide a critical lens for the game genre. Entire games can be built around reacting to things rather than dictating the flow, but when it comes to historical strategy, that's a bit uncommon. Humankind begins to go in that direction, but we as players are still largely unchallenged in our control of the game. Of course, some genres of games more or less need perfect control on the player end, more often technical and mechanical games. People don't tend to like it when chance is involved in skill challenges. Tripping in Smash Bros comes to mind as one of the most controversial examples. I would argue that while it's not a staple of the genre, challenges to control could slot right into historical strategy. To some extent, it's already there, but only in very limited ways. There's games like Crusader Kings, where much of the gameplay is about events, good and bad, and plans go awry, but when you tell troops to march, they march. When you click on something in the interface, you can still trust it will happen. And most games don't even go so far as to include a possibility of sabotage. When's the last time you played Civ or Europa or Humankind and set a build order for a city and then checked back later and it was just totally different from your plan? When was the last time your units started fighting each other? When was the last time a revolution dethroned you? We the player, for the sake of gameplay, exercise a particularly complete control over our nation, people, or country, even transcending the limits of mortality and physical government. As such, there's little room for other agents within our world. Two games come to mind that buck this trend, but I want to focus on one that felt more chronologically synced with a concept we're about to explore, Victoria 2. To be brief, Victoria 2 is a historical strategy game by Paradox Interactive, like most of the ones in this series, that takes place between the years 1836 and 1936, beginning before the Scramble for Africa and Coronation of Victoria, and ending before the Second World War. It's an imperfect bridge between EU4 and Hearts of Iron. Beyond the setting, the game differs from the other ones I've mentioned in that it is far, far far more concerned with the economy. It goes in-depth modeling the needs of a country's people across a range of professions, social classes, and ideologies, and maybe you can see where that taps into social history. With that summary down, let's move on to three topics. Player autocracy, loosing the reins, and what a true social history envisioned game might look like. We the player are the head of a perfect autocracy. I alluded to this before in the core episode, but these games, in simplification, or in their goal as a game, almost always fall into giving us perfect control. As player autocrats, our decisions are not internally challenged. Functionally, most government forms in games like these don't err in that one base assumption. Republics are seldom more chaotic. In fact, in EU4's case, they're outright more stable. This is a bit odd, no? This is speculation, but I would wager there's a bit of a recursive loop going on here. It's hard to make internal challenges that don't feel like petty roadblocks. But then, in the case of something like EU4, for example, that's what they become. It's often quipped that overextension is just a number, the joke being, push it past the limit, who cares, haha, <laughs> but on another level, it is just a number. It's not an interesting photo beat. It's not something you outmaneuver like French soldiers or negotiate with like Holy Roman electors. It's just a number. You click a button and wait. But some players vocally dislike these simple impediments, so making them more complex feels like a big risk to take. Developers can't full stop remove the weaker management aspects for fear of the game playing itself or lack of player control. So they decide to remove barriers to player control smooth them away from the genre. In turn, we end up with map painting games where impediments to our artistic vision are frustrating more than they are challenging. Internal management becomes a casualty of design. 
Player autocracy is a staple of the genre, but it doesn't have to be one. Sure, this means finding the balance between many things, the balance of being impactful and engaging enough to end up being fun to deal with while not being so tedious and omnipresent to become an unfun run killer, but it can probably be done. Would this allow social history to seize the reins? No, but it might invite social history to the table. You see, because we are both always at the top of the pyramid and always expecting a button click to do what it says, we are unable to be in the opposite position. We are the powers acting upon the world by design. We create societal change and do not live with the repercussions. In turn, the more the aesthetic of your government slides towards populism, the more nonsensical it feels to still control it all flawlessly. Republics, as I said before, in this game are far too stable, but also far too singularly driven. In a sense, all governments are in these games because we're immortal with a timeless game plan, and we can see the future, oil will exist eventually, stuff like that. There aren't factions that meddle with the player's plans, no possibility of losing out to internal pressure or revolution. Revolution in these games is, in turn, completely disempowered. It's a non-threat, sometimes even something to be sought for the sake of powerful bonuses or change to a better government. So let's talk about when rebels matter. One more stop before we get to Vicky, I promise. Where I once called Humankind a very reactive game, one where the player is allowed to plan around the reality they've been handed, and where Civ would incentivize restarts, Crusader Kings is more about reaction as gameplay. CK3 focuses on realm management and, as such, has chance-based events all over it. This disempowers players. Sometimes it gets derided as being too RNG and innately frustrating, and I get why. It sucks to feel like your perfect plan was foiled by a random drunkard blabbing his mouth. It stings to have a dream consolidation of power via a marriage be ruined by the dumb luck of infertility. These are things that, when staring at the game from the outside, seem cosmetic in their differences from EU4, which also has events, but they impact your game far more than EU4. They are gameplay. And so we come to another form of disempowerment, and finally, to Victoria 2. If you haven't played it, I fully understand why. It's why I decided to make the social history episode center on humankind, where Vicky could have fit it almost better in some ways. It's an old game, and its workings are truly arcane at times. Victoria 2 is largely about managing forces beyond player control, but it's in a very different way than Crusader Kings. Where Crusader Kings revolves around events and deaths and what feels like sudden RNG, Victoria 2 is more about trying to shape tides, to push events in a direction you prefer, knowing you can't fully control it. You have to change the minds of your people. You have to incentivize what you want. And while we might step away from the full-on potential to be a fail state that revolution is in CK3, it's not as harmless as in much of the rest of the historical strategy genre. If you're familiar with the game, you probably already know what I mean, and if you're not, it might be one of the few things you've heard about Vicky 2. Two things are a constant of that game. One, rebels are dangerous, and two, everyone hates liberals. Now, quick caveat here, liberals does not mean our contemporary American use of the term. It's like liberalism liberal, John Stuart Mill liberal. Now, as for the uh, anarcho-liberals, there's not a great parallel to any form of serious political platform, position, philosophy, or organization that has ever existed. On some level, they're like ANCAPs, but they're just in this nebulous space of vague, militant libertarianism that tends to still involve itself in electoral politics, and often is pro-military and pro-certain state functions, but more aggressive about its laissez-faire position, while even less interested in some other civil liberties. Okay, every ideology in the game needed an extreme version, so conservatives got reactionaries, socialists got communists, and they had to model together some kind of extremist centrism, so they did. 
Each ideology has certain common features to it across borders, certain things that shape what your government, you the player, can and cannot do with respect to your economy. Even a constitutional monarchy is limited by the empowered party, even an autocrat is limited, though they can change the party when they want. Which leads us to rebels and their danger. First off, they can get massive and cause revolution spirals slash cycles, ping-ponging a country between one ideology and another with no breathing room. And dealing with them after they've won is still a challenge. Rebels will force your government to change its structure, sometimes going so far as to disempower our ability to remove their party from power. Ironically, this means even though you're nominally controlling a despotic government, you can't make the choices you, as a player, would ideally want. You may control a despotic nation, but you are unable to loosen your grip without pressure to do so. Here's an example. Say the reactionaries win a revolution and install a presidential dictatorship, or even an absolute monarchy. Now I, as a player, can make use of the state capitalism policy they have to shape my economy. But I am forbidden from changing things like voting laws, political party legality, union laws, labor laws, health care, any of the functions of government. In fact, with a regressive party in power, they will actively seek to dial back civil liberties. Militancy among the people causes further repression and can be a tough spiral to break where militancy among the people in a simply conservative government means allowing greater liberties as a way of letting off pressure. Think of it like concessions to a riled masses. But players can't just enact reforms whenever they want. They are beholden to this dance between militancy and the desires of the upper house of the legislature, your senate in American terms, who, even when appointed rather than elected, are still drawn from within your nation's population and still hold views of their own. You can't, as a player, simply click one or two buttons and force the upper house to think liberally. You can't force them to liberalize just by promoting party loyalty. It's more complicated than that, and they have their own interests. And so, we turn to liberals and why people hate them. As far as disempowerment goes, liberals take the cake for this game. They are probably the most antithetical to player autocracy that I've ever seen within the genre. With the Liberal Party in power, the player still has some measure of choice in their government, but with an anarcho-liberal party, abandon hope for doing much beyond directing the army and slowly dragging your country back into your control. The general control isn't what upsets players so much as the utter lack of economic control, and that's shared with liberals as well, which is why they aren't often distinguished from each other, extremist or not. Simply put, in a game with a huge focus on economies, they wrest that focus from you. Like, as an anecdote, if you try looking up how to get liberals in power because, say, you're a country in the new world and you want to speed through reforms to boost immigration, you'll have to sift through tons of posts being like, how to avoid liberals, stopping liberals from taking power. Having liberals in power isn't all bad, though, especially late game as an already industrialized nation, because they come with certain bonuses and save you from having to micromanage an industrial empire. One could even argue that they would be a very powerful force from the get-go if the capitalists they enabled were just a bit smarter about what factories they build. On some level, though, I'm hesitant to call the inefficient and sometimes downright foolish choices of the capitalist population an effect of bad AI so much as that, well, they're out of our control. We aren't offering hyper-specific subsidies for particular businesses. It's easy to imagine them as just men with a dream, the hope common of all young boys of the 19th century that they'll be able to save up and someday open a canning factory and profit, supply chain be damned. History is full of failed businesses. I mean, that's the entire premise of the free market. If Vicky 2 laissez-faire market capitalism somehow magically always worked, then there would be literally no upside to the notion of a planned economy. While I understand the impetus to point at the screen and go, why are you trying to build a luxury furniture factory when we don't even have timber, I think it's easy to imagine some reasons. Maybe the hapless capitalist was once an artisan who made luxury furniture, He's doing what he knows and convinced his fellow money men to invest. 
From a gameplay slash development position, it's obvious that having the capitalists be too smart or player-like in their industrial endeavors would make state capitalism and planned economy just an exercise in micromanagement. As a rule, games are better when they have imperfect automation and incentivize player engagement. Like, imagine a total war game where the auto-resolve battle feature delivered better results than a human player could get. <laughs> that would be crazy and so broken, and thankfully has never happened. Planned economies would be pure tedium for no benefit if the capitalists would just do what you would do. Managing industry, which is an entire facet of the game, would be reserved for jump-starting the industrialization of an underdeveloped nation or small efficiencies. I find loosing the reins is interesting and can still absolutely be powerful. It's a gameplay choice, when it's a choice at all, that comes with its own rewards and style of play. Mexico, for example, goes very differently as a democratic capitalist haven than it does as a reactionary empire. Ultimately, when the player is forced to let go, the game doesn't stop because the population of your empire isn't solely an obstacle. They're an engine. Their needs and production fuel your empire. Their politics become your gameplay. The framework of resources make a game out of materialism. Materialism is likely a word you've heard before, or perhaps materialistic rings more bells. It is commonly used as a derisive word to critique things like a person or society that values material things, being materialistic, caring about physical objects as opposed to, say, spiritual well-being or some such thing. But it can also mean an emphasis on the tangible. And as such, it is important to discussions of class and economics when looking at history, because what, if not material possessions, is the greatest signifier and reinforcer of things like class? In turn, materialist analysis posits that ownership of things, tangible items, materials, is the largest motivator of momentum in history. And it's a fairly compelling argument, like, people need things, we need food, Spiritual starvation is much less an existential threat than literal starvation. It stands to reason, then, that when Madonna said the boy with the cold hard cash is always Mr. Right, she was engaging in what we call dialectical materialism. Materialism is the foundation of social and material history, unsurprisingly. And you can see how those things motivate this game. With a focus on populations and needs and consumptions of goods, resources and their production are star of the show. The entire motive of colonialism was resource acquisition, under the guise of uplifting conquered people, but whatever, and much the same here. Through one means or another, players need more people and resources so that the twin engines of production and consumption keep running. This is what it means to see history as driven by the material rather than the ideological, the spiritual, and so on. Victoria 2 goes a more materialist route than a social history route, still opposite great man theory, but not fully committed to the bottom-up depictions of history. It takes the emphasis on individuals out of the historical strategy equation and instead focuses on things like, well, material conditions and resource ability within class structures. One might even argue it goes the distance and incentivizes an outright Marxist path, or that at least on some level, going through the stages of history as Marx details is viable. However, given the disdain for liberals everyone has in this game, it might be best to just skip from authoritarian to socialist or something. I personally like playing the new world, so liberals aren't that bad for me, and the disempowering is interesting on some level, but that's a tangent. Make no mistake though, despite the game not going as far as bottom-up power depictions, materialist history in a Marxist fashion is indeed opposed to great man theory. It directly posits that rather than individuals, history is propelled by the advancement of class agendas. To truly depict social history, a game would need two phases. One, where you build society and make a sweeping societal change, and then the other, where you're forced to play as an individual or small group living through said change. Most games can't really emulate social history for the same reason they tend to fail at portraying revolutions or anarchistic movements. We as players are the top-down state. To empower the people in a game would mean either playing as them in some kind of way, which one could argue humankind tries for, or it would mean a game where the player has control wrested from them. In a sense, since we are the state, the people are forced to be an obstacle. 
I'm reminded of how in Hearts of Iron 4 they added the anarchist Catalonia as a faction of the game, and how it stands out in its weirdness, invites mischaracterizations, and by design feels like a faction that can't really play the game, but does anyway. Like, by definition, it is a non-state in a game where being the state is the only form of play. So it ends up in this weird space of playing like a state anyway, but with some unique mechanics. I wouldn't call that ideal, but as I've said, collectivist slash bottom-up power structures are resistant to being games because a game requires some form of impact and singular control. Within the vocabulary of the historical strategy genre are the terms micro and macro, used to describe how zoomed out or zoomed in a game can get. For strategy games in general, the word micro sees an additional use surrounding micromanaging, often with respect to player preference in having to finely tune every little thing or letting the game be automated. Micro is when a player has to assume direct control of an interaction or exchange in order to get a desired outcome. Relevant to our conversation, though, is that games in the genre run the spectrum of being macro or micro in their depictions of society, the degrees of smoothing over, of obfuscation. How much control do we have? How much can a player tinker with a single ship design, with a province's buildings and layout, with a battle's orders, that sort of thing? One of the issues with social history is that it, in its framework, is extremely micro. It is zooming in further than any game realistically could. It would be like if in EU4 you could zoom in so far that each province has a map of, like, Stronghold 3, and you could click on some random peasant and see him go about his day and hear his little complaints about bread prices or something. But something else to keep in mind is that if a game like EU4 did let us zoom in that far, the general conventions of the genre might mean being able to micromanage that peasant, tell him to drop what he's doing and go get bread, because we, as players, have substantial control and can usually override the autonomy of modeled individuals. In the end, does this mean that all these games are inherently authoritarian? Kinda, to be honest. Does that make them bad? Not unless you are repulsed by the mere thought of governance. Internal narratives are more or less a rarity in the genre. History is depicted as a struggle between nationalities, between countries, large entities. It is genuinely rare to find games that both model complex internal situations and maintain an external context of a broader world. Crusader Kings may be almost exclusively about the upper classes of society, but it does at least show us that balance between internal management and external politics. The gameplay of being in a realm but not heading it is intrinsically different from that of being the monarch or of having no vassals. You lose elements of play on either side of that. I feel like it's possible, though it might just be stupid complex, to make a game that involves both navigating rich internal politics and class and facing a world beyond your own borders. Victoria 2 is a very materialist perspective on history. If you haven't played it, it's challenging to get into, and that's part of why I didn't use it as my social history example. If you have played it, you might have noticed it would have been just as flawed for a choice for representing social history. But it does provide us with a very interesting lens into how player autocracy functions and how it gets subverted, while also giving us a game that is very interested in the makeup of a society. Ironically, I think the best government for representing us as players is that awful event in EU4 that turns the country toward bureaucratic despotism. If nothing else, it would mean that the state has come to most closely resemble the undying faceless entity that we are, but that wouldn't get us any closer to a social history game. Look, I know it's basically a meme for paradox gamers at this point, but mixing in Vicky systems to some games would be really neat. If a game had Victoria 2's crazy exhaustive internal mechanisms and the reactive focus of humankind, it might just be amazing. Here's hoping Vic 3 somehow matches its decades of meme tier hype. Imperator Rome is kind of a sweet spot, actually. Civil wars are a danger, pops are presented, individual human leaders are present, but we still play as the state rather than the people. So it's somewhere between all the games I've mentioned before. I won't go on a tangent here, but suffice to say, it got a lot of things right and has, or had, a lot of potential. It's also the subject for another day. With that, we're past halfway through the series and have the bonus episode out of the way. Next time for real will be Imperator. I know I kind of bounced around with what I said was coming out when, but it is, for sure, the next video in the playlist. 
After that, it gets weird. Anyway, if you got here from somewhere other than being a sub already or watching the series thus far, maybe subscribe if you liked it, or check out these other videos or the bigger playlist. I don't just do historical strategy game stuff, but for now it's a bit of a focus. Eventually I'll even end videos in a way that isn't awkward, so stick around for that evolution if you like.